So, uh, Matt, a quick thanks for the, uh, for the great intro at the start. Uh, I feel like I've got a lot to live up to already. Um, I actually was um, in the first one of these, and I was sat in the audience thinking, yeah, yeah, I can do this. And I'm actually wondering now whether that was a wise decision to volunteer myself. But there you go. Um, I run London Green alongside Joe, Joe Green. He's here somewhere. I can't actually see him, which is strange because he's really tall. Joe, give us a wave. I actually come from quite a long line of, of entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, nobody that set the world alight. Sorry, Dad, but you, you didn't. Um, <laughs> nobody that's um, been involved in property or construction. Uh, but I grew up kind of convinced that I was going to be my own boss. I was going to chart my own course, which has uh, kind of led to a strange decision of me actually signing a training contract with an accountancy firm when I was 21. Uh, I still don't know quite why I did that, but I did but I've got quite high pain threshold, so I stuck it out. Uh, and after three years, I became a, a qualified chartered accountant, and I think that's the first time I've ever admitted that to a group of property people. Um, but as soon as I qualified, I moved over to corporate finance, did a lot of IPO, secondary fundraisings, M&A type work, actually quite enjoyed that, businesses and people that are trying to do something. But after a couple of years, I got the call I'd been waiting for uh, from a client. It's a boutique retail investment fund, great management team, what was then a dream team of shareholders and real ambitions to grow. So I jumped at the chance to join. I joined in a fairly junior finance role. But within a couple of years, I'd become a, a partner in the business, had a small equity stake. Um, we bought shopping centers, retail parks, supermarkets. I'm guessing there's not any retail park spotters here. I don't know if anybody wants to hazard a guess where this is or knows where this is. No, it's Peel Centre in Bracknell. Favourite of mine, given it's the town where I grew up. Um, but in essence, we, uh, we built up portfolios of these things and every time we got to any meaningful size, uh, a Landsec or a Hammerson would just come and buy us out and we never had to do any of the asset management initiatives that we, uh, that we bought them for. Now, if you could have ever picked a three-year period to have been in retail property investment, the summer of 2004 to the summer of 2007 was just it. Yields compressed and we couldn't help but make shed loads of money. Um, I take no credit for my timing on the way in. That was just a complete fluke. But in the summer of 2007, we sold out our third portfolio in three years, about a billion pounds of assets bought and sold, all told. And the expectation was we we're gonna go and raise loads of money until it became a bit bigger. But I resigned, and everybody I knew thought I was a complete idiot. But in 2007, I was feeling pretty uneasy about the state of the world. It didn't make sense to me that you could get twice the return investing in risk-free government bonds as you could by buying some really crappy retail in a really dismal town in the north of the country. It didn't make sense. My local postie had become a minor celebrity, having bought his 20th buy-to-let. You know, I'm the property guy, but my postie owns 19 more properties than I do. Um, it didn't make sense to me that our, our government had drummed into us for years and years and years that their fiscal prudence had put an end to boom and bust. And we had this whole generation of people that up to the age of kind of, well, mid-30s that had never worked through a recession that just didn't ever think one was going to come. So uh, I left. And while I was working out my notice, we had the run on Northern Rock, uh, the first run on a high street bank for over 100 years. And I was feeling pretty smug. <laughs> So uh, while I was um, working out my notice period, I was trying to, uh, and, and then beyond into my uh, six month mini retirement, I was trying to work out what I was going to do with myself. Uh, I generally enjoyed being at home and getting under my wife's feet, um, but she didn't like that. So um, I, I had an idea that I wanted to go into Resi, despite what I thought might happen in the wider world. I thought that you know people need somewhere to live, therefore if the you know if there's a bit of a downturn in the economy, resi values will hold up. Definitely got that one wrong. Um, but I was also, there's also like a more humane side of, of, of resi property in that there's not many things that are more fundamental to someone's sense of well-being than the place in which they live. And I was quite attracted to that. And also perhaps the idea of placemaking. And I found that really compelling and I still find that compelling. So uh, about the time that I was thinking, you know, maybe I'm not really hard-nosed enough, a bit too soft around the edge to be doing this on my own, uh, I had a call from a recruitment consultant that I'd used to recruit people into the fund. Uh, and we had a bit of a chit chat and I said, look, I'm thinking about going back into you know, kind of a job. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I quite fancy Resi. And she said, oh, I've got this great up and coming developer uh, called London Green. You know, they've got real great ambitions to grow. They've got all these great regen schemes. And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Where is it? 
She's like, Fish Island? Hmm. Uh, no idea. Where's that? East London. I was like, nope, I'm not interested. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> a few days later, my interest kind of rose. This was the days before the internet was useful for finding stuff out. And so I agreed to, uh, I agreed to go and meet them. And I went out there and I was blown away. I was blown away by the projects they had and I was blown away by the people. And there was one person that I was particularly blown away with, which is Philip Green, who's Joe's dad. He's not the Arcadia Philip Green and he's not the Carillion Philip Green, but to us, he's the Philip Green. And um, Philip has set up London Green in 1998. He'd been developing since 1985. Um, but he, he kind of formalized his operations in the late 90s. And they had nine years of kind of year-on-year -year profit growth and revenue growth. And they had the ambition to become a regional house builder with a 300 million pound turnover. And I thought, you know, this is a really exciting opportunity. I really want to be a part of this. Um, so I joined. I joined in March 2008. And the week I joined was the first week where people couldn't remember we had a single sale. There was just no sales. The second week I was there, there was no sales. We got one through in the third week. But within six months of me being there, um, our main bank had gone bust, our main contractor had gone bust, and then when Lehman's went bust, uh, the whole world kind of turned to shit, frankly. Um, so that was one of the uh, schemes that London Green had delivered just before I joined. Um, if you ever kind of read the Homes and Properties section Evening Standard, you'll always see this one when they do a special on Bow or Fish Island. London's Green's growth, being meteoric, would have been fueled by a cross collateralization of debts and always plowing all of the profits back into the next scheme. And when the credit crisis took hold, we had nothing to fall back on. All of the sites pretty much went into receivership. All of our entities into administrations and liquidations. Essentially, 10 years of graft and toil and profits just evaporated overnight. It was a, it was a pretty grim situation, frankly. Uh, so within a year of me joining, everybody else had left. I, I tried to leave a number of times, and I'd get one foot out of the door, and Philip would drag me back in. Um, 2009 was grim. The only bright spot in 2009, although I didn't really appreciate it for a few years, was actually that was the year that, that Joe joined us as well. Um, so in 2010, we're trying to start from scratch. We've got no assets. We're trying to make deals happen. Lenders don't want to lend to us. Investors don't want to invest with us. People just didn't want to transact with us full stop. It was really demoralizing stuff. We had a couple of years, we just banging our head on after brick wall after brick wall. And every time we think we've got a deal we can do, doors just close. People just kind of turn their backs on us. Joe was starting to take a bit more of the role of kind of finding the sites and finding the opportunities. And we, we were getting kind of a few, a few kind of potentials. But then we turned into 2011 and, uh, and Philip and I sat in the office and Joe rings us up, and he's really excited. He said, oh, I've got one. I think we can actually do it. I think we can do it. I've got a really good feeling about this, but we've got to move fast. And he gives Philip and I the most basic of details, and we say to him, okay, sounds good. Joe takes that to mean go and exchange it, <laughs> which he does. <laughs> and we find out, and, and Philip and I are kind of crapping us, thinking, what has he got us into? We better go and see this property. So Joe gives us the address, and we leave for the safety of the West End, and we trek out to Hackney, and we're kind of all oh, a bit of excitement, a bit of nervousness. We're walking up the road towards the site, thinking, where is this building? We're expecting to see this amazing development opportunity unfold. But all we get to is this nondescript mid-terrace house in a nondescript mid-terrace street, thinking, hmm, something's not right here. Maybe we wrote it down wrong. So we stood there for a few minutes, and my pink floral jacquard shirt that puts me right home in the West End, I'm marking me out as a bit of a target uh, in the wrong part of Hackney, <laughs> and thinking I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go soon because I'm not feeling safe. And then Joe comes round, bounding round the corner, and he's really excited, and he's saying, what do you think, what do you think? And we're like, what do you think, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> Anyway, we, we go in, and this house has already been converted into three pretty rubbishy flats. And uh, because Joe's got an exchange, we have to get it done. So we beg and we borrow. I don't think we stole, but I'm not going to dwell on it too long. But we got it over the line, and uh, we sent in some tradesmen, and we did a very light touch refurb on the first and second floor flats. It takes us a little bit longer to get access to the ground floor. There's a DSS tenant, and we've got no idea how to deal with DSS tenants. We've got no money left for a lawyer to tell us how to deal with DSS tenants. We go and knock on the door. 
And uh, she basically takes pity on us downhill West End developers, and she tells us how to get her evicted. <laughs> <laughs> so this takes a few months to go through the process. And on the day that she's been evicted, we turn up and we go along to get the keys and we also go along to thank her for being really, really nice to us. I can't remember if we took her flowers. We should have done if we didn't. And uh, she's moving her furniture out. We see this square on the carpet. And we're like, well, that's a bit odd. So Philip bends down and he peels back the, the square and, and there's this kind of hatch. And Joe pulls up the hatch and we have a little look. We go and get a light, we have another look. There's a fully formed basement. It's plastered, it's dry, it's got electrics, it's got plumbing. We ended up, our ground floor flat, being a duplex flat. We cut back the front of the, of the floor and we basically made a whole lot more money than we thought we were going to make. And basically, Joe's good feeling for what seemed like a pretty crappy deal basically put us back on our way. So, good work, Joe. Um, we then had a period... Essentially, 2013, 14, we were doing lots of single flat refurbs. We started to do a small, you know, a few small planning plays, um, starting to feel a, little, a bit better about ourselves. Um, we hit on PD very quickly, um, not in the way that Martin's kind of doing with his micro flats. That came to us later. We would essentially go get a site, get PD, go back to the council, say we could do that, or we could do this new new build scheme instead. Uh, and by the time we'd got planning and by the time we'd done deals with the tenants to go somewhere else, there's invariably somebody that's willing to buy a site, pays lots of money. So we did that a few times. And as Joe kind of cemented his position as finding sites and bringing deals in, I was kind of dealing with the finance side, but also kind of the legals and those other bits and pieces. Joe and I started to kind of take a bit more control from Philip. And... Um, that's something that, that has continued ever since. This is a, a site we, um, well, this is not a site we acquired. We got planning for this building. Um, it was a PD scheme originally, uh, about 10,000 square feet, I think. I can't remember now. Um, we bought this for, for two million pounds, this site, in 2014. It took us three attempts to get it through planning. We got a new build scheme, and we sold it for over eight, a couple of years later. So that was kind of one of the better deals that, that we did. Um, but then moving on from 2015 onwards, um, Joe and I still taking a bit more control from Philip, still driving the business forward, feeling good about the world. Um, we were getting a bit of a good track record. We were showing agents and, and vendors that we could complete on our purchases. We were showing banks we could borrow money and we could repay them. We were showing investors that we could turn a profit. Um, but Joe and I are a bit concerned that all we were really doing is following in the footsteps of London London Green won, as it were, that we were just recycling our profits all the time into the next deal. And if the music stopped again, it would all disappear again. So we took a decision that we wanted to start moving into income-producing assets, essentially converting buildings or, or building buildings, but then keeping them for a long-term hold. And not just individual units, but whole schemes. That led us to take a decision to bring the design function house so we can control the product. And then that led us to wanting to bring the construction house so we could then control the costs and the program. Um, so this is something that's continuing to evolve. We still do planning game. We still do build for sale. But build for rent is really where our focus is. Um, this is actually one of our build for sale schemes. It's just on the market at the moment. Ian, who's a prospective member, can't quite see Ian. Ian's leading the sales process on this, along with my colleague Andrew with a funny hair at the back. Do you want to give people a wave? Yeah, great. So, uh, but this is this is a good, good little PD scheme. Um, so, in terms of our current portfolio, um, our rental portfolio just go over 200 units. Half of that's income producing, half it's in construction. We've got 357 units in our for sale portfolio, portfolio, 304 in planning, and 95 in pre-planning. I like to work in units. I think GDVs are a bit vain, but I know a lot of people do like GDVs. But going back 2010, we had nothing. Now we've got a portfolio. Now we're pushing forward, and, and times are pretty exciting. Uh, in terms of the future, who knows? Um, Joe and I have got a common vision about where we want London Green to go and what we want London Green to be, perhaps more than what we want London Green to do. Um, always conscious that it, property is a very slow-moving industry, yet exists in a very fast-paced world. And although it's great to have a long-term plan, 
actually things can change very quickly. And if you're not fleet of foot and you're not responsive to opportunities and challenges, then you're going to get left behind pretty quickly. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a fastidious pursuit of achieving short-term goals that's going to allow us to reach our long-term vision. Um, just a quick bit on Quorum. Um, I saw the ad uh, just before Christmas, I think it was. Didn't really know uh, what it would be like, but I liked the idea that there was a kind of a bringing together opportunity and the know-how and the finance. Um, in terms of what we're going to contribute, it could be any of those things. At the moment, I think maybe opportunity, definitely some know-how. But as our business evolves from development to investment, it kind of stands to reason that at some point in the future, we might start looking to invest and finance other people. That's something that I find quite exciting. But we're always open to new ideas and new opportunities. And if anybody's got something they'd love to show us or ask us about, then by all means, drop me an email, send me a LinkedIn. Um, if you send me a LinkedIn, send me a little message saying we met a quorum, otherwise probably ignore it. For uh, and if I don't respond to either of those, just get Lara to, uh, to get on my case. And if anybody's got any questions, then uh, <laughs> go for it.